You remember John Adams appointed all those Federalist judges as he left office, the midnight appointments? Well, one of those was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, John Marshall. And John Marshall will take this, his responsibility in his eyes of preventing Jefferson from getting his way very seriously. And he will seek to strengthen the power of the Supreme Court. And he will do so successfully in Marbury v. Versus Madison. This is an 1803 case, and it also deals with these midnight appointments. Now, what had happened was Adams had filled out the appointments, the letters giving people, judges, these jobs, and left them on the desk uh, when he left, because remember he did it on his last night in office. And when Jefferson arrives, he sees these appointments on the desk, and he hands them to his Secretary of State, James Madison, uh, whose job it would be to deliver them. Madison delivers some, but he won't deliver uh, a few because he, he doesn't like these people. And one of them is a guy named John Marbury, who had been appointed to be a Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C., which is a fairly low-level job. Marbury goes to the Supreme Court and asks it to force uh, Madison to deliver uh, the appointments, and the court says they can't do that. Um, the, uh, uh, although they, they could have legally, this would have been from the Judicial Act of 1789, which said they could compel uh, delivery of these letters. Marsh, uh, Marbury then goes and asks Congress to um, uh, support him. And at this point, the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice John Marshall will weigh in and rule in the Marbury versus Madison case. And what he will say is that Congress cannot redefine the powers of another branch of government. So Congress cannot force the president to do anything because that would violate the idea of separation of powers. If Congress could simply order the president to do something anytime he did something they didn't like, there would be no separation of powers and the president would, presidency would be completely uh, powerless. Uh, now, what Marshall did here is fairly clever because the, the most important thing that comes out of this case is the Supreme Court claiming the right to rule an action of another part of the government unconstitutional. This is called judicial review. The idea that whenever the Congress or the executive branch does anything, um, the Supreme Court gets to look at it and decide if it's okay, which of course makes the Supreme Court incredibly powerful. But he also rules in favor of Jefferson here, or Madison, who is of course part of Jefferson's cabinet, which means that Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans support the decision. Marshall will use this new power uh, uh, to dramatically uh, uh, strengthen his Federalist ideas. We'll talk a lot about that in the next chapter. Another great man of the age is Napoleon. Now, Napoleon and Jefferson both came to power in 1801. In 1804, Jefferson is re-elected and Napoleon crowns himself Emperor of France. Napoleon uh, first attempts to take India from France. Napoleon dreams of creating a French empire. And his first uh, target is India. And he fails, I'm sorry, he fails to take India from Britain for France. And then he decides to use all that territory that the French had not had, had, had given to Spain at the end of the French and Indian War. Uh, they get this territory back from Spain, and he decides that he is going to use this to launch a French empire in the New World, which would mean, by the way, conquering America. Um, Jefferson hears rumblings of this and begins to distrust France, which is important because Jefferson had always been a Francophile, a, a, a fan of the French. Remember, he had supported the French Revolution. In 1802, the Spanish actually tell Americans they can no longer use New Orleans. Spain still controlled New Orleans at that point. And Americans in the West get very angry because the Mississippi River is so important, and of course it goes down to New Orleans. Jefferson sends a diplomat, Livingston, uh, Robert Livingston, uh, to France to offer to buy the city of New Orleans from Napoleon. He then hints to Napoleon that America is thinking about allying with the French and taking New Orleans by force. When Livingston gets to Napoleon, uh, Napoleon says, why not just New Orleans? I'll sell you the whole thing. Now what had happened here is Napoleon's plan to create an American empire had fallen apart because his army in France had been stuck in uh, uh, its port because the, the, the winter was extra long and the ice didn't clear and so they couldn't get out of Europe. At the same time, his army in America had gotten yellow fever and had been decimated by disease. Napoleon rapidly changed his plan and decided he wanted to take over Europe instead after, after his second attempt to create an empire had failed. And he needed money to do this. And so he decided to sell Louisiana, uh, what we call the Louisiana Purchase to America for $15 million. Now, this is an incredibly good deal. And of course, as you can see, it's almost going to double the size of America. Uh, Livingston and James Monroe, who's there with Livingston, 
will agree to buy Louisiana. Now, this is interesting because they have no way to communicate with Jefferson. So here they are. They've gone out and they've bought the territory of Louisiana and spent $15 million of America's money without any real authority to do so. But the offer is so good, they feel like they have to do it. So when they return to America, you know, you, you can kind of imagine them coming in. And uh, Thomas, um, while we were out, uh, we bought something. And, of course, it turns out to be this huge piece of land, uh, and it turns out to cost $15 million. Jefferson knew it was a great deal. He understood that, that America couldn't really not do it. But he was torn because, remember, he had argued against the uh, Necessary and Proper Clause. Remember when Hamilton created the Bank of the United States and Jefferson said the Constitution didn't give him the right to do that? Well, now Jefferson is, is buying this enormous chunk of land, and there's nowhere in the Constitution that says he can do that. And so Jefferson uh, eventually gives in and uses the Necessary and Proper Clause, or the Elastic Clause, as we call it, to justify uh, his buying of the Louisiana Purchase. Um, Louisiana will become the first state from that territory in 1812. Before the purchase of Louisiana, so before we actually buy it, Jefferson wants to explore the West. He's particularly interested in the plants and animals that are out there because he knows there are plants and animals we've never seen before. He sends uh, Mary, uh, 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 Lewis and Clark, Meriwether Lewis and, uh, I'm forgetting Clark's first name, out into the west, and you can see the path they take here to explore this territory. Um, it's a, a fantastic journey with lots of interesting adventures, and they get all the way to the Pacific Ocean and return and report to Jefferson what they find there. Uh, we should also mention Sacagawea, who's a, uh, I believe, 14-year-old Native American girl who guides Lewis and Clark um, across most of this territory, uh, and she does this the day after giving birth to a baby. So she gives birth to a baby, and the next day she walks to the Pacific Ocean. Um, other explanations will be Zebulon Pike exploring the upper Mississippi River and later the Rockies where Pike's Peak will be named after him. Um, and he will be the first American explorer to claim that the Great Plains are a desert. We'll talk more about that later.